أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا السماء فطرت وإذا الكواكب تثرت وإذا البحار فجرت وإذا القبور بعثرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم وإن الفجار لفي جهيم يصلونها يوم الدين وما هم عنها بغائبين وما أدراك ما يوم الدين ثم ما أدراك ما يوم الدين يوم لا تملك نفس لنفس شيئا والأمر يومئذ لله صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. When the sky is cleft asunder, when the stars are scattered, when the oceans are suffered to burst forth, and when the graves are turned upside down, then shall each soul know what it has sent forward and what it has kept back. O oh man, what has seduced you from your Lord, most beneficent. Him who created you, fashioned you in due proportion, and gave you a just bias. In whatever form he wills, does he put you together. Nay, but you do reject right and judgment. But verily over you are appointed angels to protect you, kind and honorable, writing down your deeds, they know and understand all that you do. As for the righteous, they will be in bliss, and the wicked, they will be in the fire, which they will enter on the day of judgment, and they will not be able to keep away therefrom. And what will explain to you what the day of judgment is? Again, what will explain to you what the day of judgment is. It will be the day when no soul shall have power to do aught for another. For the command that day will be holy with Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Master of the Day of Judgment, Lord of all the worlds. And may the peace and blessings be upon his messengers, starting from Adam, through Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Jesus, culminating with Muhammad, and everyone in between, peace be upon all of them. Those who brought the same message, which was, the eternal oneness of the Lord and submission to His will. So those who heeded it and those who will heed it and thereby perform acts of righteousness will be rewarded with felicity and peace in His eternal company. 
and those who do otherwise will be left to his infinite mercy and justice subhanahu wa ta'ala a brief introduction of the speaker dr zakir naik is a medical doctor by profession he is the director and founder of the Islamic Research Foundation, which goes by the name IRF. It is an organization set up to disseminate information about Islam and remove misconceptions. He is a distinguished orator who has visited several countries and authored several books to do with Islam, comparative religion, and modern science. He is also the founder of a school for children in Bombay, otherwise known as Mumbai, and very much like, in this, in this sense, is very much like Yusuf Islam, otherwise known as Cat Stevens. Without further delay, I'll give you Dr. Zakir Naik, but I'll just introduce the agenda. We'll start off the talk, and due to the speaker's commitments, he'll have to leave about 4.30. So based on the agenda that you might have in front of you, the break will take place after 4.30, that's after the speaker has left. You're free then to ask any other questions that may not be pertaining to the subject to the brothers and other members on the stall. Um, we'd like to acknowledge IPCI for um, bringing Dr. Zakir Naik here and allowing us the opportunity to have him. And uh, I'd request all the audience to um, keep the questions during the question answer session directed to the topic. Um, you will have an evaluation sheet probably in front of you or on, on, on your chair and we'd request you to fill it in so that um, in f we can get some feedback to improve future events. Without further ado, I'd bring you Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain. أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل يحل الكتاب تعالى إلى قلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخيز بعدنا بعدا أربابا من دون الله فانتولوا فكلوا شدوا بأننا مسلمون رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل الأقدة من لساني my special elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the greetings which were used by all the prophets of God. In Hebrew, it is Shalom Alaikum, and in Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum. May peace be on all of you. The topic of today's talk is. Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Three men and one mission. And this will be my last talk in this lecture tour of mine for the past six days, which has been organized by the IPCA Birmingham. There is a lot of misconception amongst many people especially regarding the mission of these three great personality. There are many misconceptions amongst most of the people regarding the mission of these three prophets of God. Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Yes. <coughs> okay. Most of the people they think that Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he preached Judaism. Most of the people think that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the founder of this religion, Christianity, and he preached Christianity about 2,000 years ago. And most of the people also think that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is the founder of the religion of Islam, and Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. 
and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of this religion but he is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God. All these three great personalities, all these three great prophets, they preached one same message. They had one same mission. That is to preach to the people submission to the will of one God alone. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, Verse number 24, Allah says, Wa im min ummatin illa khalafiyah nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 7, Wa li kulli in had. And to every nation have we sent a warner. That means Almighty God has sent a messenger, a prophet to each and every nation to each and every kind of people. There are 25 messengers, prophets of Almighty God mentioned by name in the glorious Quran. For example, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. By name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the, in the glorious Quran. And Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was Christ, he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. By name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the Quran. But Allah also says, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 164, and Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 78, we narrate to you the stories of some of the messengers, of the others we don't. That means only the stories of some of the messengers have been mentioned in the Quran. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi he said, that there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. But all the messengers that were sent before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people. They were only sent for one particular kind of people, one particular nation. And the message which they preached was meant to be followed only till a particular time period. For example, Moses, peace be upon him, as is mentioned in the Bible and the Quran, he was sent only for the Jews. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 49, that Jesus, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. And the same message is mentioned in the Bible. Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his apostles, that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are the non-Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, told the disciples, that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, Enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost ship of the house of Israel. <coughs> Jesus, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, he said, that I have not been sent, but to the lost ship of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Quran and the Bible, 
he was sent only for the Jews. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Quran says that he was the last and final messenger of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim mirjalikum, wa laakhi Rasulullah, wa khatamun nabiyin, wa kana Allahu bi kulli shayin alima. That Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of you, any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah. And he is the seal of the prophets. And Allah is all-knowing, full of wisdom. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, he was not sent only to the Muslims or only to the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. Allah repeats the message in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, where it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَافَةَ لِلْنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا We have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, he was sent for the whole of humanity. And this message is repeated by the Prophet himself, by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the Book of Salah, chapter number 56, Hadith number 429, the Prophet said that I have been given five special things which no other Prophets have been given. And one amongst them he said that all the other previous Prophets, they were sent only for their nation. And I have been sent for the whole of humanity, for the whole of mankind. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. That's the reason he has been prophesied in all the major world religious scriptures. And he has also been prophesied by Moses, peace be upon him. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157, they followed the messenger, the unlettered prophet, who is mentioned in the scriptures, the law and the gospel. And if you read the Old Testament, you will find it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. Almighty God says that I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall command all that I say. This is a prophecy of a prophet to come. The Christians, they say, that this prophecy is prophesizing the coming and the advent of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And if you ask them that how does it prophesize the coming of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they say that the prophecy says, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee. The prophet to come should be like Moses, peace be upon him. And the reason they give why Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is like Moses, peace be upon him, is that Prophet Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them both, both of them were prophets of God. Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them both, both of them were Jew. If these two are the only criteria for the fulfillment of the prophecies, then all the prophets mentioned in the Bible, after Moses, peace be upon him, they fulfill the prophecy, like Solomon, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, John the Baptist, all of these were prophets of God, and all of them were Jew. If these two are the only criteria, then all the prophets mentioned in the Bible, after Moses, peace be upon him, they fulfill this prophecy. 
In fact, if we analyze the person who befits this prophecy is no one better than the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Because Moses and Muhammad peace be upon them, both of them were born naturally. They had a mother and father. Whereas Jesus Christ peace be upon him, according to the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 1 verse number 18, as well as the Gospel of Luke, he was born miraculously, without any male intervention. And the same is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 40 to 47, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born miraculously, without any male intervention. So Muhammad and Moses, peace be upon them, they are alike. Whereas Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them, they are not alike. Furthermore, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were married and they had children. But according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not married, he had no children. Furthermore, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, both of them, they died a natural death. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the false reading of the Bible, the Christians, they say that he was crucified. Whereas the Quran mentions in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, that he was raised up alive. But both agree that he did not die a natural death. That's the reason Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they are alike, whereas Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them, they are not alike. Furthermore, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, both of them, besides being prophets of God, they were worldly kings. That means they could give the punishment of life and death to the person who deserved it. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 18, verse number 36, my kingdom is not of this world. And furthermore, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, both of them, they were accepted as a whole by the people. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not accepted by his people. And he says in the Gospel of John, chapter number 1, verse number 18, he approached his own and his own did not receive him. Thus if we analyze Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they are alike, and Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them, they are not alike. That's the reason this prophecy befits no one better than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And furthermore, the prophecy says, I shall raise up a prophet from among thy brethren. And we know that the Arabs are the brethren, the relatives, the cousins of the Jews. And further it says, I shall raise up a prophet from among thy brethren like unto thee. And I shall put my words into his mouth and he shall say all that I command him. And we know that the revelation of the glorious Quran when it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Archangel Gabriel, whatever he heard, he repeated it verbatim, as though words were put in his mouth. And the next verse of Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 19 says, that whosoever shall not hearken unto his words, I shall require it of him. That means, Almighty God says, I will take revenge from him. Furthermore, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is also prophesied in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12, where it says that the book will be given to he who is not learned. And when it will be said to him, pray, read this, he will say, I am not learned. And this is exactly what happened when the first revelation was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Surah Ikra or Surah Alaq, chapter number 96, verse number 1, and when it was said to him, Ikra, he said, Ma ana biqari, I am not learned. Exactly the fulfillment of the prophecy, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. He is even mentioned my name in the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, 
verse number 16 which says hikko mamitakim bi kulli muhammadin zaidudi zairai baina jerusalem which means his mouth is more sweet he is altogether lovely he is my beloved he is my friend o daughter of jerusalem the word muhammadin is mentioned in the hebrew text of the old testament because in the semitic languages and in hebrew for respect im is added so to the word muhammad to the name muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam im is added so it becomes muhammadim but they have translated it as altogether lovely but his name is present in the bible and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the quran in surah saf chapter number 61 verse number 6 that jesus he is upon him the son of mary he said o children of israel i have been sent as a messenger from almighty god from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirming the law that came before this and giving you glad tidings of a messenger to come whose name shall be muhammad whose name shall be ahmad not only is prophet muhammad peace be upon him prophesied in the old testament he is even prophesied in the new testament and jesus christ peace be upon him himself prophesied the coming of this last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 14 verse number 16 where jesus christ peace be upon him says that i will pray to my father to send you a comforter who will abide with you forever the message is repeated in the gospel of john chapter number 15 verse number 26 where it says jesus christ peace be upon him says that and when the comforter will come whom my father will send he will glorify me it's further mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 16 verse number 7 Nevertheless I tell you the truth Jesus Christ peace be upon him says Nevertheless I tell you the truth it is expedient for you that I go away for if I go not away the comfort shall not come for if I depart shall he come There are many Christians who say that this comforter refers to the Holy Spirit The criteria mentioned in this prophecy for the comforter to come is that Jesus Christ peace be upon him should depart only if Jesus Christ peace be upon him departs shall the comforter come if he does not depart the comforter shall not come and we know from the bible that the holy spirit was already there before Jesus Christ peace be upon him came in this world he was there in the womb of the elizabeth the holy spirit was also there when Jesus Christ peace be upon him was being baptized so surely this comforter mentioned in the bible does not refer to the holy spirit and the original word used actually it is parakletos which means the praiseworthy but they have changed it to paraklete which means the merciful but the translation given in the bible is comforter but irrespective whether it is parakletos or paraklete whether it is the praiseworthy or the merciful or comforter alhamdulillah all these translations they befit no one better than the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him and jesus christ peace be upon him he further prophesied in the gospel of john chapter number 16 verse number 12 to 14 he said that i have many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear it now how be it when he the spirit of truth shall come he shall guide you unto all truth he shall not speak of himself all that he hear shall he speak he shall glorify me again this prophecy confirms the coming of the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him he who gave to the world the last and final message of almighty god allah says in the quran in surah rad chapter number 13 verse number 38 that we have sent a revelation in every age that means there was several revelations sent on the face of the earth but by name 
Only four revelations of Almighty God are mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But all the revelations that came before the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, they were only sent for one particular group of people. They were only, when, they were only sent for one nation. And the message which was mentioned in these scriptures was meant to be followed only till a particular time period. But the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, it was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs, as the Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. Alif Lam Ra. We have revealed the book to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that thou may lead us, the humankind, from darkness to light. Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52, that here is a message for humankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is only one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humankind, as a criteria to judge right from wrong. Allah says in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that we have revealed the book to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to instruct the humankind. It does not say to instruct only the Muslims, or only the Arabs. It says to instruct the whole of humankind. Thus we know that all the three great prophets, all the three great personalities, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all, they preached one common message of submission to the will of one true God. All of them, they preach Islam. Islam comes from the root word Silm or Salam, which means peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. And any person who submits his will to God, in Arabic, it's called as a Muslim. And if we read and if we analyze the scriptures of all these three great personalities, they had one common message of submission to the will of God. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, It's mentioned Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Iman, hadith number seven, the Prophet said that the religion of Islam is based on five principles, on five pillars. And the Prophet said, the first is the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, It is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, that you believe in the last day, that you believe in His angels, that you believe in His books, and you believe in His messengers. It is compulsory that anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, he should believe in one God, he should believe in the last day, in the year after, he should believe in the angels of Almighty God. He should believe in all the books, all the revelations of Almighty God. And he should believe in all the messengers, all the prophets of Almighty God. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul Yahya Kitab, say, O people of the book, say to the Jews and Christians, Come to common terms asked between us and you. Which is the first term? 
Allah na abda illallah that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyaw that we associate no partners with him. Wala yatta khiza baad dun baad dan arbaab min dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawalla. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say ibe witness. Bianna muslimun that we are muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best way to speak with different types of people, Allah says, Ta'ala wila qalmitin sawa'im bainan wa bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one almighty God. And this is a message that was preached by all the messengers, all the prophets of almighty God. And the best definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can be given from the Quran is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakullahu kuffan ahad. There is nothing like Him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God, which is given in the glorious Quran. If any person says, so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, the Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. The first is, Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Second, Allahu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Third, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُلَّهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ There is nothing like him. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. It is the litmus test to confirm whether the candidate is Almighty God or not. And the same message was preached even by Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, said, شَمَا إِزْرَائِيلُ أَدْنَ الْحَيْنُ أَدْنَ يَخَدْ it's a Hebrew quotation which means, Hero Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandments, he repeated verbatim what was said earlier by Moses, peace be upon him. And it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo, Adna Lahin Adna Ikhad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Hero Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. And all the messengers of Almighty God, they preached that you should not associate partners, any partners with this one true God. And it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116. And in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive the sin of associating partners with him. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. But if anyone who has associated partners with Almighty God, he has strayed away very far. The biggest sin in any religion is associating partners with Almighty God. And the same message was given by Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5, it says, Almighty God says, that thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness, in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, and the water under the earth. Thou shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. And the same message is further repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 79, where it says, that thou shall have none other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness, in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. Thou shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So if you read, the message of these three great men, you'll get the message that they preached 
that you should worship only one God and you should not associate any partners with him. But unfortunately, yet there are some of the followers of these great men to attribute partners to Almighty God. There are many Christians who claim that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. In fact, the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, it says, لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ وَالْمَسِيُّ بْنُ مَرِيمَ They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming those who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is Almighty God. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيُّ But said Christ, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِلِ O children of Israel, أَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ Worship Allah, رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. In no may shrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ لِلْ جَنَّةِ Allah will make jannat haram for him, paradise will be forbidden for him, وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِ مِنَ النَّسَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no help in the hereafter. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, In no may shrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ لِلْ جَنَّةِ Allah will make jannat haram for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِ مِنَ النَّسَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place and he shall have no help in the hereafter. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. I would like to repeat, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says worship me. In fact, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, he said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he is a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he submitted his will to Almighty God, and he was a Muslim. In Arabic, which means submitting his will to Almighty God. In fact, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, he said, that think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Until the heaven or the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall break away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments, and teach men to do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep them and teach the same, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. That means, if you want to enter paradise, you have to be better than the Jews. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. In fact, he said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, he said, that the words you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3, this is life eternal, so that you may know Almighty God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus, peace be upon him, he even clarified a simple statement which can be taken in the wrong sense by a cynic. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, that once a person approaches, approaches Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and tells him, Good Master, what good things shall I do so that I shall gain eternal life? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Why thou callest me good? There is no one good except Almighty God. And if thou want to enter eternal life, you keep the commandments. 
Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not say that if you want to go to paradise, believe that I am God. He never said that if you want to go to paradise, believe that I was crucified on the cross. He said that if you want to enter eternal life, you keep the commandments. That means all the commandments that was also mentioned by Moses, peace be upon him. And it's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It says, Emir of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. Therefore, if you read the Bible, you shall understand the correct message of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Quludullah Awidur Rahman, Ayamatadu, Falaw al Asma al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Al Hakim, most merciful, most beneficent, most wise. No less than 99 different attributes. And this message that to Allah belongs the most beautiful name, besides Surah Isra chapter number 17 verse number 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Araf chapter number 7 verse number 180, and Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse number 8, and Surah Al-Hashar chapter 59 verse number 24, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful names. But the crowning one amongst all this is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? The reason is because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's plural of God. There is nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes Goddess meaning a female God. There is nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah is a unique word. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah by in Islam. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Ami in Islam. If you prefix a ten before God, it becomes ten God meaning a fake God. There is nothing like Tinn Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when the Muslims are speaking to non-Muslims who may not be aware about the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if they use this word when they are speaking to non-Muslims, if they use God instead of Allah, I have got no objection but I would like to remind them that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. And this word Allah is mentioned in all the major religious scripture of the world. Even if you read in the Old Testament, the word for God is Allah. And for respect, they add Im, Elohim, Allah or Elo. Similarly, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross, according to the Bible, it's mentioned that in Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, as well as Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, when he was put on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, so as to say, O God, O God, why hast thou forsaken me? In each and every language, each and every translation of the Bible, this phrase of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, on the cross has been maintained. Any translation of the Bible you read, any version of the Bible, this phrase, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani has been maintained. Now, does this Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani sound like, Oh God, Oh God, why has thou forsaken me? 
بس اللہ اللہ لما سبقتنی ساؤنڈ لائک جو ہوا جو ہوا واحد دخو سے گرمی but if you translate into Arabic Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages if you translate اللہ اللہ لما سبقتنی into Arabic it means اللہ اللہ لما ترکتنی does it sound similar? yes and if you read the Scofield's dictionary of the Bible written by Reverend Scofield he mentions that Allah and the alternate spelling he gives E-L-A-H or Allah A-L-A-H is the same as God we spell it A-double-L-A-H but the same Allah or Allah so even Reverend Scofield and the Christian scholars they agree that Allah is the proper name for Almighty God. The second pillar of Islam is Salah. And many of us, we translate Salah into English as prayer. To pray means to ask for help, to beseech for help. In the Salah, the Muslims, besides asking for help, we also thank Almighty God and we also receive guidance from Him. That's the reason I personally, instead of translating Salah as prayer, I prefer calling it programming towards righteousness. It's a sort of programming. But if you hear the Azan and if someone wants to go for Salah and if someone asks, where are you going? And if he says, I'm going for programming, I'm going for brainwashing, it will sound a bit odd. That's the reason I've got no objection if someone translates Salah into prayer. But prayer is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Salah. For example, if the Imam, while offering Salah, after he recites Surah Fatiha, he may recite Surah Maidah, chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amun, O you believe, innam al khamru wal maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishtu minam ili shaitan, these are sacred animals. First anibulla lukum tuflihun. Abstain from this handbook that you may prosper. Here we are being programmed in our salah that you should not have intoxicants, should not gamble, should not do idol worship, should not involve in fortune telling. Here we are being programmed. The Imam may recite after Surah Fatiha, Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 188, which says that spend not your wealth on vanities, nor use it as a bait for judges, in order you may eat little bit of other person's wealth unknowingly. Here, our Creator is giving us guidance that you should not bribe. We are getting programmed that bribing is wrong. That is the reason Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45, Utlu ma uya ilayka minal kitabi, waqimu salata, inna salata, tanhaan ifashai wal munkar. That recite of what we have revealed to thee by inspiration and establish regular salah. For salah restrains you from shameful and unjust deed. And we Muslims, we offer salah minimum five times a day. How for a very healthy body, you require about three meals a day. Similarly, for a very healthy soul, minimum five times salah is required. We see the amount of wrong things happening around us because once if the program is done to the computer it gets programmed but the human beings we have a free will there are high chances that we can get deprogrammed that's the reason we program ourselves we offer salah minimum five times a day because of the evil we look around us so that we stay on the sirat al mustaqim and the requirements and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as far as Salah is concerned this commandment was given to Moses peace be upon him it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse number 11 and 12 that when Moses peace be upon him when he approached the fire he heard a voice oh Moses verily I am your Lord take off thy shoes from thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy grounds you are in the sacred valley of Tuwa this commandment was also given to Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Acts. Chapter number 7, verse number 33. It says, 
that, O oh Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy grounds. This message is also repeated in the book of Exodus, chapter number 3, verse number 5. The Almighty God says to Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy grounds. To so send this with a commandment given to Moses, that before offering prayers, we should take off the shoes from their feet. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad he also said, it's mentioned in Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 240, hadith number 653, the Prophet said, based on the authority of Shu'ib, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, that my father said, that his father said, that he saw the Prophet pray barefooted, as well as with shoes. Therefore, we have been given the permission to pray barefooted as well as with our shoes on. Allah further says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 6, that, Ya ayyuh al amunu, O you who believe, when you prepare yourself for salah, wash your face, and wash your hands and arms up to the elbow, rub the head with water, and wash your feet up to the ankle. Wudu is a requirement, is a prerequisite before offering salah. And this was a prerequisite mentioned by all the prophets to the followers. If you read, it's mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 40, verse number 31 to 32, that Moses and Aaron and his sons, they washed before they appeared in front of the Lord, the Herat. Moses and Aaron, they entered into the temple of congregation and before they appeared in front of the Lord, they washed themselves. It's further mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 21, verse number 26, that Paul took them in and he washed himself before he entered the temple of congregation. Ablution, washing yourself before offering salah, before praying, is a prerequisite mentioned by all the prophets of Almighty God. Furthermore, Abu Lawit Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adhan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692. Hadith Anas, may Allah said, that when we stood for salah, our shoulders touched the shoulders of our companions, our feet touched the feet of the companion. It's further mentioned in the Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, hadith number 666. The Prophet said before of starting the Salah, stay in your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, do not leave any gap or opening for the Satan, for the devil. The Prophet was not referring to the devil which you see in the museum with two horns or a tail. The Prophet was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of creed, irrespective whether rich or poor, king or pauper. When you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective whether black or white, yellow or brown, when you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. And the best part of Salah is the prostration, it is the sujood. No wonder the word sajda and the derivative is mentioned in the Quran no less than nine two times. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 43, Ya Maryam, Ya Maryam muklitil rabbi ki wasjudi warkai marraqeen. That, O Mary, worship thy love devotedly. Prostrate thyself and bow down with those who bow down. Allah says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78, that, Ya Ayyuh Al-Lazina Amunu, O you believe, bow down and prostrate yourself and adore your Lord. And do good deeds so that you may prosper. The best part of the Salah is Sajda, is prostration. Because our body is voluntary under our control. If I want to raise my hand, I can raise it. If I want to take a step forward, I can take a step forward. But my mind is not directly under my control. That's the reason the psychologists they tell us that if you have to humble your mind, the best way to do it is to put the highest part of the body, the forehead, on the lowest part of the ground. And then, as the Muslims say, Subhanahu bin Ala wa Glory be to Allah the Most High. Glory be to Allah the Most High. Thrice. The best way to humble your body, the best way to humble your mind is to humble your body. And that is exactly 
how all the prophets of God prayed when they prayed to Almighty God. And we can read this in the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verse number 3, where it says that Abraham fell on his face. It's mentioned in the book of Numbers, chapter number 20, verse number 6, that Moses and Aaron fell upon their face and the Lord appeared to them. It's mentioned in the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, verse number 14, that Joshua fell on his face and he prayed to God. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 26, verse number 39, <clears throat> that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, went to the garden of Gethsemane, he took a few steps forward, fell on his face and he prayed to the Lord. <clears throat> the best part of Salah is Sajda, and all the prophets of God, Abraham, Moses, Aaron, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, they did prostration when they prayed to Almighty God. <coughs> I'm sorry. The third principle of Islam is Zakah. Zakah means to purify, it means to grow. And every rich person who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. And the criteria for zakat is given in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60. And it's mentioned in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 7, that zakat has been prescribed so that it prevents the wealth from circulating only amongst the rich. If every rich human being in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being will die of hunger. That's the reason it's also mentioned in the first Peters. Chapter number 8, verse number 4, where it says that give fervent charity. For verily, charity covers up multitudes of sin. It's mentioned in first Peter. Chapter 4, verse number 8, that give fervent charity, for charity covers up multitudes of sin. The fourth pillar of Islam is psalm, a fasting, that we should abstain from food, drink, and sex from dawn to sunset for one complete lunar month in the month of Ramadan every lunar year. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. The reason fasting has been prescribed is so that you may learn self-restraint. And today the psychology they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And there are various benefits in fasting. Various medical benefits too. It increases the intestinal absorption. It decreases the cholesterol level. It gives an opportunity to inculcate in your life good things. It gives an opportunity to stay away from bad things. If a person can stay away from alcohol from sunrise to sunset, he can very well do it from the cradle to the grave. If a person can abstain from smoking, from sunrise to sunset, he can very well abstain from the cradle to the grave. And that's the reason fasting has also been prescribed in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 17, verse number 21, as well as Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 29, that the believers should fast. The fifth pillar is Hajj. That's a pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah that every adult who has the means to perform Hajj and his health permits him, he should at least perform Hajj. The pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah during the month of Hajj at least once in his lifetime. And here we find that this is the biggest annual gathering of the world. About two and a half million people gather from different parts of the world from USA, from Canada, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from India, from Pakistan, from different parts of the world. And the men, they are dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. 
You cannot identify the person standing next to you whether he's a king or a pauper. It's the best example of universal brotherhood. And that's the reason that the pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah is even mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, chapter number 84, verse number 4 to 7, that blessed are those who make a trip to the sacred valley of Bakka. And Bakka is another name for Makkah, which is also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 96, that the first place of worship of Allah was Bakka, which is another name for Makkah. These were in brief the five pillars of Islam submitting our will to Almighty God. But this does not constitute the complete religion. But if the pillars, if the principles are strong, inshallah, God willing, even the structure will be strong. If you submit your will to Almighty God, you are following His commandments. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ insa illa لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. The reason the human beings have been created is to worship, is to obey the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. If you obey the commandments of Almighty God, you are submitting your will to Almighty God. <clears throat> For example, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, Verse number 90. Ya ayyuhu al-lazina amun. O you believe. Innam al-khamru al-maysuru. Most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Wal anzabu al-azlamu. Dedication of stones, divination of arrows. Rishtum minam li shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. First anibu lalukum tuflihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here we are guided by our creator that you should not have intoxicants. That you should not gamble. Should not do idol worship. Should not do fortune telling. The same message is repeated in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, that wine is a mocker. And whosoever has it is deceived. This message is repeated in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, that be not drunk with wine. Even the other prophets of God, besides Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them, they prohibited the drinking of intoxicants. If you obey the commandments of Almighty God, you are submitting your will to Almighty God. It's mentioned in the Quran in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 173. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145. And Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115. It says, Hurrimat alaykumul maitutu waddamu walahmul kinzeed. Wa ma ahuilla li gairilla bi. For bring for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is invoked. These four foods has been prohibited in the Quran. Dead meat, blood, flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Almighty God's name is taken. And these four foods have also been prohibited in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus chapter number 17, verse number 15. And the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 21, that you shall not have the meat that died of itself. That means dead meat is prohibited in the Bible. And drinking of blood has been prohibited in the Bible in no less than five different places. It's mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 4. In the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 14. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 12, verse number 16. In the first Samuel, chapter number 14, verse number 33, and the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29. In no less than five different places, drinking of blood has been prohibited in the Bible. If you read the Bible, the Bible even prohibits pork. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, that the swine, though it has cloven foot, it choose not the cud. It's unclean for you. Thou shall not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. It's unclean for you. The same message repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, that the swine, though it has cloven feet, it choose not the cud. It's unclean for you. Thou shall not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. 
It is repeated for the third time in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5, that you shall not have the flesh of swine. So all the prophets, not only Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even Prophet Moses and Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, they have prohibited the eating of pork, the flesh of swine. And the fourth food, any food on which any name besides God's name is taken, it's even prohibited in the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29, and the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, verse number 14. So all the foods which are prohibited in the Quran, in these verses, are also prohibited in the Bible. Prohibited by both Moses and Jesus, peace be upon him. Because Jesus said, peace be upon him, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 70 to 20, that if you break even one law or tittle, one law or tittle, one jot or tittle from the law, you shall not enter paradise. Means you have to follow everything what is mentioned in the Old Testament. So if it's mentioned in the Old Testament, it becomes compulsory for both the followers of Moses, peace be upon him, and the followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, to obey the commandment. If you obey the commandment of Almighty God, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. If you are honest in business, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. If you love your neighbors, you are submitting a will to God. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, love thy neighbors. And it's also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ma'un, chapter number 107, verse number 1 to 7. That woe to those who pray only to be seen of men and do not even provide neighborly needs. If you backbite, you are disobeying God. If you do not backbite, you are obeying the commandments of Almighty God. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Humza, chapter number 104, verse number 1. Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. If you respect your parents, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 to 24, that we have ordained for the human beings that you worship none but me, and that you, kind, that you be kind to your parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say a word of contempt, but lower to them your wing of humility and address them in honor. And pray to the God that blessed him as the cherished me in childhood. If you marry, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Niqah, chapter number 3, verse number 4, he said, that all oh, young people, whoever had the means to get married, should get married. The Prophet said, anyone who does not marry is not of me. So if you marry, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. If you love your wife, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. As the Prophet said, that the best of you among the believer is that who is best to his family, including the wife. And Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 19, that treat your wives on a fitting of equity and kindness, even if you dislike her. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, Verse number 32, that come not close to adultery, for it is an evil opening other roads to evil. So if you abstain from adultery, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. And Almighty God, in all his scriptures, he has given the modesty level, has mentioned the hijab, including Moses, peace be upon him, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as well as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All of them, they gave the message of modesty. People normally talk about the hijab for the woman, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, that say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. And this is exactly what was said by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 20 and 29, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, It has been said of the old times, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, has already committed adultery in his heart. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, has already committed adultery in the heart. The next verse of Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, speaks for the hijab for the woman. It says, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not a beauty except what appears ordinarily of. And to draw her veil over the bosom, except in front of her husband, her sons, and the father, and the big list of Mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. And there are basically six criteria for hijab. The first is the extent. 
For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. There's certain scholars who say that even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is, the clothes they wear, it should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you could see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And these are exactly the same criteria which were preached by Moses, peace be upon him, as well as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5, it says that the woman shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man. Neither shall a man wear women's clothes. For all those who do this, they are an abomination to the Lord. It's mentioned in the first Timothy, chapter number 2, verse number 9. It says that the woman should be dressed up with modesty, with shamefacedness and sobriety. They should not wear costly array or gold or pearl. And further mention in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 7, it says, that the woman that does not cover her head, she dishonors her head. And further says that the woman that does not cover her head, her head should be shaved off. There is no verse in the Quran or the Hadith which says that if the woman does not cover her head, her head should be shaved off. This is an additional preaching done in the New Testament. So if you follow the commandments of Almighty God, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. All the messengers, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them, they recommended that there should be circumcision. It's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 8, that the covenant of circumcision was given to you. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 7, verse number 22, that Moses gave you the covenant of circumcision. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2, verse number 21, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was circumcised on the eighth day. So if you follow the commandments of Almighty God, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. If Jew means a person who follows the commandments and teachings of Moses, peace be upon him, then I would like to say that we Muslims are more Jewish than the Jewish themselves. If Christian means following the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then I'd like to say that we Muslims are more Christians than the Christians themselves. Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. And all the three great prophets of God, Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, they preach nothing but submitting your will to Almighty God. So if you read the scriptures, of these three great personalities, you'll come to one common conclusion that there is only one God and the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This will be directed uh, one question at a time. So, um, um, although it sounds uh, um, a bit unfair, it's for the purpose of allowing everyone to have an equal opportunity. We request the questions to be brief and definitely to the topic. If they're not to the topic, then uh, we can use, um, it's probably uh, uh, um, would be apt that you could ask them to um, ourselves um, after the, the, the event is finished. Not that we wouldn't want to answer your questions, but um, the questions um, should ideally be related to what the speaker has spoken about. Um, that's, yeah, um, yeah. No, no problem. Okay, you can fire away. Can somebody? Yeah, the volume. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. My question in particular, and I hope I have sufficient time for a brief comment is concerning the speaker which says that Jesus only came for his nation and he quoted a scripture there where he says came, he came unto his own and his own received him not but Jesus himself said to his disciples he said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel 
and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people beginning at Jerusalem teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and uh, as well I'd like to say it was mentioned there that Jesus never claimed divinity but Thomas spoke to Jesus and Thomas said after Jesus told Thomas you can put your hand in my side Je Thomas said my Lord and my God and again in Luke chapter 24 day about the disciples came after Jesus blessed the disciples the disciples worship him and the Bible said that they came away they came back rejoicing after they had worshipped him and another instance after the man was let down to the roof and was healed Jesus told him thy sins be forgiven thee Thanks. so, so on these three points I am saying yeah. Jesus is God because only God can receive worship only God can forgive sins and I'll just limit my point there That's and also he created okay thank you thanks a lot um, would the speaker like to reply the brother has two questions his first part of the question was that Jesus Christ peace be upon him did not only come for the Jews he told his disciples to go out also preach to the world what the brother is quoting is the last few verses of gospel of Matthew which according to scholars of Christianity are not the words of Jesus Christ peace be upon himself if you pick up a Bible, a red letter Bible, it contains the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him in red. These words, though they are mentioned in red, the scholar says these are not the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him in red ink is Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6, which told to the apostles that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, the way of the non-Jews. Enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost ship of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, he said, that I have not been sent, but to the lordship of the house of Israel. So the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, carries more weight than anybody else's word. Now coming to a second question. You gave several quotations saying that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he is almighty God, because people worshipped him, you are saying. But that is what other people did. If someone worships me, do I become God? If someone worships me, do I become God? If some lunatic comes and tells me, Oh Zakir, you are quoting Quran so well, you are God. Do I become God? That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He was said, God. I quoted my talk in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 to 17. One person calls him good. Good master, what good thing shall I do so that I shall get eternal life? He says, why thou callest me good? He was said, God. He doesn't know how to call good also. God has got one O. Good has got two O's. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Why thou callest me good? There is only one good and that is the Father in heaven, that's Almighty God. Regarding the quotation you gave me, you told that Thomas said, I want to check the nail print. You didn't give the reference. The reference you're talking about is Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 28. Where Thomas says, Oh, oh God, my Lord, my God. You don't give the statement, I'm giving you the statement because I'm used to speaking with Christians. The statement is, my Lord, my God. Because Thomas said, my Lord, my God, therefore Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God, according to many of the Christian missionaries. To know the context, you have to read a few verses before. And if you read Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 24 to 29, it says that when the people came to know that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, had not given up the ghost, he had not died, people could not believe. When all the disciples were discussing, Thomas said, I will not believe it until I see the nail print in, with my own eyes in the hands of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Until I put my finger into his hand, until I thrust my hand into his side. So when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, comes, he says, Oh Thomas, see the nail print, put thy finger into my hand and put thy arm into my side. And then, Jesus, and then Thomas, peace be upon him, says that, my Lord, my God. This is an exclamation. For example, you know, if I'm discussing for a long time, and if I'm talking to a friend, and he says, My God! It is 4.30! Does it mean I'm calling him God? 
It's just explanation. Yes, sir. If it was false, Jesus would have rebuked him. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> Will my friend tell me? Oh, don't call me God. He understands it's an exclamation. If, if I'm talking to my friend and he says, Oh, it's late. My God. It is five o'clock. I have to go. So yeah, then, oh, don't call me God. <laughs> I have the sense. I'm not a lunatic to tell him, don't call me God. I know you're not calling me God. It's an exclamation. My God, it is so late. So if you read the context, you come to know there is not a single unequivocal statement. And furthermore, in my talk, what I said, Jesus Christ himself did not say. All the three quotations you gave was of somebody else telling his God. What I told in my talk, I challenge any Christian. I challenge any Christian to point out a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me. If other people say that, does not make him God. Anyhow, I've given you the answer even for the three quotations that you gave. Hope that answers the question. Brother. Can I just... Um, <clears throat> yeah, can I just request uh, most of the brothers and um, anyone in the audience that we shouldn't really laugh aloud while the speaker is um, answering the question because it's not befitting the nature of such an, a, a talk. Also, if um, speakers are allowed to come and uh, reply, um, um, they have another opportunity, provided the mic is available, but we'd request them not to speak during um, the time that the speaker is speaking, just to give justice to his answer. You're, you're free now if you want to, seeing that the mic is free to come and use it again. We'd give preference to people who don't share the Islamic faith, seeing that this um, event is ideally so that we can remove misconceptions about Islam and um, educate people about Islam. But if there's no one else, then um, Muslims are allowed. Please. Oh, sorry, other, sorry, the sisters, sorry. Um, yeah, this, could the sister ask the question? Um, the question isn't actually relevant, so we'll leave it till afterwards. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can come again. Um, is that, does the gentleman at the back want to ask? Okay, go on, go ahead. What I'm really, um, as the, the brother mentioned there that Jesus uh, did not, did not rebuke Thomas, and when, when he was worshipped, that anybody um, could receive worship as well. But if you study the scriptures carefully, you will see in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, when John was in vision there, and John fell down to worship an angel. And the angel stopped him and said, See that thou doest it not. For I am of thy fellow servant, thy brethren. Worship God, for him only shall, shall thou worship. Or so on. Or worship God. Now I'm saying here that Jesus Christ was perfect in all his ways. He said, there was no sin found in him. He said of the Jews, which of you convicted me of sin? And certainly in his life, in his life he never did anything that was wrong. And the very fact that the Bible records that the disciples worship him. Now if they had done something wrong, certainly Jesus would have withheld himself. Certainly he would have rebuked them. I can remember that after Jesus rose from the grave that the woman came at the tomb and 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 fell down to worship him, to hold him. And the speaker just limited. Yes, I know I'm limited here. So, what I'm saying there really is that if worship was not due to Jesus, he certainly would have refused it. And secondly, if he was not God, as Thomas, Thomas said, then certainly he would have rebuked such a statement. Thanks a lot for your Thank point. you. Okay. The brother again has given the same statement that people worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and he didn't rebuke them. That means that he accepted it. Brother, all these statements you have mentioned, all these quotations are in black. Black means not the words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So if it's not the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, how can Jesus Christ stop them? The only way Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, can stop them, if the words are in red. And the quotation which I gave you in my talk are the words in red, said by Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself. Dot all the things that you have said is a third party narration. For example, Revelation. You know Revelation? Revelation is a dream seen by St. John. 
in the dream you can do anything in the dream anyone can become god so if you see in a dream someone has become god that doesn't mean that person becomes god what i told you by the condition that i gave you all of them alhamdulillah all of them are in red letter means the words of jesus christ when i say jesus christ said my father is greater than i it's in red my father is greater than all it's in red and even the one of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 to 17, when a person approaches Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that what good things shall I do so that I shall enter eternal life? This is the words in red. Then Jesus Christ, peace be upon replies, Why thou callest me good? Because he himself is speaking. All the other quotations you gave are in black ink. Black ink means somebody else is telling. Red ink, according to the Christian scholars, if it is a red letter Bible, it is the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself. And himself says, why thou callest me good? There is no good except one that's Father in heaven. So do you mean to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon is contradicting? Sometimes he's saying he's God, sometimes he's saying he's not God. He's not, he's saying I'm not good also, leave us at God. Furthermore, even when he was asked that if you want to enter eternal life, he said, keep the commandments. He didn't say worship me. And furthermore, regarding the statement you said, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon, did not commit any sin, I agree with you, brother. We as Muslims, we believe that all the prophets of God, they were sinless, they were masoom. So we very well agree that not only Jesus Christ, peace be upon, was sinless, even Moses, peace be upon, was sinless, and even Muhammad, peace be upon, him, was sinless. And we agree with you in this point that they were sinless. But because they were sinless, that does not make them God. That because they were prophets of God. They got the message of Almighty God to deliver it to the human beings. Hope that answers the question. Could you have a question from the sister's side, please? Well, assalamu alaikum. Um, a friend of mine who is born Catholic has been struggling to accept Islam for eight years and finally came to a conclusion that, here's what he said to me, quote, I could no longer reject Lord Jesus because if I accept Islam, Lord Jesus would not be the Son of God, unquote. How could I help him? Thank you. Thanks a lot. The sister has a question that one of her friends studied Islam for eight years and finally came to the conclusion that if I accept Islam, I'll reject Lord Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And I cannot reject Lord Jesus, peace be upon him, because he is the Son of God. Regarding the first part of his statement that he'll have to reject Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If he rejects Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he cannot be a Muslim. To be a Muslim, one of the criteria is he has to accept Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. If he rejects Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he cannot be a Muslim. So first part of his problem is solved. As I mentioned in my talk, that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Any other religion he accepts, he'll have to reject Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, except Islam. Now coming to the second part of the question, that how can... He cannot reject that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is not Son of God. As far as the term the Son of God is concerned, God has got sons by the times in the Bible. If you read the Bible, the Bible says, Adam was Son of God, David was Son of God, Ephraim was Son of God, Israel was Son of God. It's mentioned in the Bible in the book of Romans that as many are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Means whosoever is a righteous person is the son of God. If you are righteous, you are son of God. If I am righteous, I am son of God. So most verily we do agree that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, most verily was the son of God. We have no objection. But there are many Christians who say that no, 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 no. He is not a normal son. He is the begotten son of God. And they quote, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, they say that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him shall not die but have everlasting life. This is the only quotation they can give to prove that son of God, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was different. He was unique. Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him shall not die but have everlasting life. What is the meaning of the word begotten? And if you ask any Christian what is the meaning of the word begotten, it will be difficult to answer. Begotten means sired by God. It's a function of lower animals of sex. 
And if you read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the RSV, revised by Thaidu Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different corporate denominations, these Thaidu Christian scholars, they say that this word begotten in Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, is an interpolation, is a concoction, is a fabrication. And they threw it out of the Bible. So if you read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, revised by Thaidu scholars of the highest eminence, Christian scholars, they say this word begotten is an interpolation. So the only verse with which the Christian missionaries can cling the deal, the Christian scholars have removed it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is just the Son of God. And if, as the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the sons of God, we verily agree that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, most verily is the Son of God, but he is not the begotten Son of God. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse 1 to 4, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allahu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufanad. There is nothing like him. The moment someone begets, or someone gets begotten, he is not Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Can I have a question from the brother's side, please? Assalamu uh, I first have the opportunity to thank you for a very informative talk, mashallah. Uh, my question is that Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam came with one mission. How would a follower of that one mission respond to scriptures of, uh, for example, Hinduism and Sikhism? Could you repeat the last part? How would a follower of that mission brought by the uh, prophets, peace and blessings be upon them, respond to the scriptures of Hinduism and Sikhism? <coughs> The brother posed the question that how will the followers of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad peace be upon them follow? Or how will they respond, respond to the scriptures of the Hindus and Sikhs and the Sikhs etc. As far as the scriptures are concerned of the other religion, Hinduism etc. As I mentioned that even if you go to these scriptures of the Hindus they too talk about the same common mission. They too talk about the same common mission where people may ask me, that does it mean that Ram is God, or is he a messenger of God, sorry, or is Krishna a messenger of God? See, as the Quran says that there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth, by name only 25 are mentioned, I cannot say that Ram or Krishna is surely the messenger of God. Because the name is not mentioned in any Quranic verse, neither in any Sai Hadith. What I can say, maybe they are, maybe they are not. But even if they are, the messengers of God, they were meant for those people and for that time. Today, you have to follow the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Coming to the scriptures, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, similarly, there has been a revelation sent in every age. By name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. Veda, a question may be asked, can we consider it to be the word of God? I say, I don't know. We cannot say for sure it's the word of God. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. But even if it is the word of God, it was only meant for those people and for that time. Today, we have to follow the last and final message, that's the last and final testament, the glorious Quran. But in spite of this, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79, فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ يَخْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابِ بِيَدِّهِمْ سُمَّا يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ اِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا فَوَيْلُ لُمْ مِمَّا قَتَبَتْ اَيْدِهِمْ وَيْلُ لُمْ مِمَّا اَكْسِبُونَ Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from Allah, to traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what they write, woe to those for what they earn. All the revelation that came before, the glorious Quran, the last and final revelation, all of them have not been maintained in the pure form. Allah says, people have changed the scripture. They have not been maintained. The only revelation, because since it was meant for a particular time period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't think it fit to preserve it. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 9, we have revealed the Quran and we shall guide from corruption. But in spite of this, in spite of this, even though they have been changed, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Almighty God, that yet, in this corrupted form, yet you will find the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in it. The prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And you can refer to my video cassette, which mentions these prophecies. He has been prophesied in the Puranas. He has mentioned the Bhavishya Purana, Khanda 3, Adhyata 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. 
यू ऑल्सो प्रोफेसाइज इन भविष्य पुराना पर्व थ्री खंड थ्री अध्यय थ्री श्लोक ऑफ टेन ट्वेंटी सेवन ही प्रोफेसाइज इन द साम वेद बुक नंबर टू चैप्टर नंबर सिक्स वर्स नंबर एट ही प्रोफेसाइज इन द कुंट ऑफ सुक्तास दैट इज द थर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी हिंद नंबर वन ट्वेंटी सेवन वर्स नंबर वन टू थर्टीन ही इज बीन प्रोफेसाइज इन द थर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी chapter number 20 verse number 6 there are several prophecies about him in the hindu scriptures he is also prophesied in, in the six scriptures he is also prophesied in the parsi scriptures you can refer to my video cassette muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the various world scriptures so if you have to be a good hindu you have to follow prophet muhammad peace be upon him if you have to be a good parsi you have to follow prophet muhammad peace be upon him if you have to be a good buddhist you have to follow prophet muhammad peace be upon him not only is prophet muhammad peace be upon him prophesied even the mention that you should worship only one god is mentioned in the scriptures if you read bhagavad gita chapter number 7 verse number 20 it says all those whose desires all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires they worship them in gods so bhagavad gita says all the materialistic people they do idol worship amongst the hindu scriptures the others Adi Upanishads. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ekam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sutta Sutta Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na kasya kasij janita na kadipa. Again, it's a Sanskrit quotation which means Almighty God has got no Lord. He has got no parents. It's mentioned in the Sutta Sutta Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number nineteen. Na chasya pati ma asti. Of Him there is no likeness. Among the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. It's mentioned in the Yajurved, chapter number thirty-two, verse number three. Na tasya pati ma asti. Of him, there is no images. It's mentioned in the Yajurved, chapter number forty, verse number eight, that Almighty God is bodiless and pure. It's mentioned in the Yajurved, chapter number forty, verse number nine. Andhatni pavishanti ya asamuti mo paste. They are entering darkness. Those who worship. The asambuti, the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. And the verse continues: They are entering more in darkness. Those who worship the asambuti, that the created things like table, chair, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajurved, chapter number forty, verse number nine. And you can go on and on quoting. It's mentioned in Rigved, the most sacred amongst the Vedas, book number eight, hymn number one, verse number one. March in the sunset. All praises are due to Him alone. It's mentioned in Rigved, book number six. Chapter number forty-five, verse number sixteen. Ya ek it mushti hi. There is only one God. Worship Him alone. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism is ek kam Brahm dusya naaste, niya naaste kinchan. Bhagwan ek hi hai, dusra nahi hai, nahi hai, nahi hai, zara bhi nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So again, even while speaking to the other non-Muslims, whether it be Hindu, whether it be Parsi, whether it be Buddhist, I use the same verse which I started my talk with. Tala vila kalmitin sawa im bayna no bayna kum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na uda illa Allah that we worship none but Allah. This is the master key according to me in the Quran for doing dawa with any non-Muslim. Let him belong to any faith. Let him not have a faith also. The best is Allah na uda illa Allah. Based on the criteria, Tala vila kalmitin sawa im bayna no bayna kum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khair. Due to with deference to the brothers and sisters standing, we won't really take uh, many written questions. Um, inshallah, we've got one, and we'll probably leave that till the end. Uh, could the sisters ask a question? It isn't actually um, a question, and I'm not going to give any Bible quotes because you probably know the Bible better than me. And any Bible quotes I give, um, you will find an apt response. But. As a Christian, as a Christian for four years, I feel that I couldn't leave without saying something to the Muslim brothers and sisters here. I've listened to the speaker, and um, a lot of what he said makes sense um, about how to serve God. A lot of it is in Christianity and in Judaism. But there's one thing I can't understand. You've talked about Jesus, but you haven't actually Pinpointed the 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 reason why he um, well we as Christians we believe he was sent from God, and you haven't actually explained um, the reason behind Christianity. And from what I've heard, the Muslim sisters and brothers 
can have a very um, biased, can I say, a biased view about Christianity. We believe that Jesus was indeed the Son of God and he was sent to take our sins away, to purge the sins of the world and without him we cannot see God if we do not confess that he is the Son of God and that we are sinners and that we actually do need him in our lives even just to see God. Can I just, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Thank can you very much, sister. Can I just make a, a short comment before the speaker that if you want to, um, rather than rather than just probably just coming to the question and answer session, if you want to, you can, you're free to interact with um, Muslim sisters or, or if you've got any other burning questions you'd like to explore the matter a bit more, then as I mentioned before, um, you can, after the talk, we'd be willing to discuss. Thanks. Thanks for asking a good question. She says that I haven't spoken much about Christianity with Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached. And she said that she believes that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came to purge away the sins and to remove the sin. That was basic two questions. And she believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Sister, regarding Jesus Christ being the Son of God, I've already told earlier that we very will believe Son of God if it means a righteous person. We very will believe that you are the righteous person as it's mentioned in the book of Romans that as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God and most verily Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was led by the Spirit of God and he is the Son of God in that context, but not the begotten Son of God. Coming to your question, why didn't I speak much about the Christianity which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached? Sister, the word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. I am a student of the Bible. The word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not preach Christianity. That's what I said. That many people have, I started my talk by saying, many people have a misconception that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the founder of Christianity and he preached Christianity. Neither was he, neither was he the founder of Christianity, neither did he preach Christianity. That's what I said. Because the word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. The only word that exists in the Bible, in the book of Acts, is that the disciples of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they were given a nickname by the people of Antioch as Christians. But the word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. It was a nickname given by the people of Antioch to the disciples of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Later on, Christians. Therefore I said, if Christian means one who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. And the full talk, sister, I gave, I gave the talk trying to prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said all these things, you should believe in one God, we believe in one God, that you should be modest, we are modest, you should not have alcohol, you should not have pork, that you should not have dead meat, you should not have blood. And all these things, what I mentioned, is talking about what Jesus Christ preached. He didn't preach Christianity, he preached submission to the will of Almighty God, which in Arabic we call as Islam. If you want to know in English, it is in English he preached a religion which says you should submit your will to Almighty God. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, not my will, but the will of God, he is a Muslim. You said, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came out to purge out your sins. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I can of my own self do nothing. So how can he take out your sins? Yeah, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, for I seek not my will, but the will of my father. What he came, he came to guide the people that how not to sin and how to ask for forgiveness. That's what he preached. And regarding bearing the sin of others, this concept of original sin, which is preached by the church, though it's not present in the Bible, that all human beings are born in sin. It's based on the concept that Eve, may Allah be pleased with her, she tempted Adam, may Allah be pleased with him, to eat the forbidden fruit. That's the reason all human beings are born in sin. The question I ask, that did Adam, peace be upon him, ask me before eating the fruit? So why should I be born in sin? If I would have given permission to Adam, peace be upon him, eat the fruit, then if Allah holds me responsible, it sounds logical. Did Eve ask you before eating the fruit, may Allah be pleased with her? If she asked you and you gave permission, 
then fine, you can say that you made a mistake. Surely she didn't ask the sisters, neither did she ask the brothers. Neither did Prophet Adam, peace be upon the masters. So how can we be responsible? And this concept that because of that, human beings are born in sin and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came to remove the sin and that you know that the only begotten son is kept as a slaughter. We doesn't sound logical at all. It doesn't sound logical at all. Imagine there is an employer who employs all his employees and they commit mistake, they rob, etc. So the employer tells the employee that now because you have robbed, because you cheat, because you don't do the job properly, I'm going to slaughter my son. And if you believe that I'm slaughtering him, then your sins are forgiven. It sounds illogical. No more any questions. And regarding inheritance of sins, what does the Bible say? Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, the soul that sins shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. But if the wicked turn and returns to the part, he shall not die. The Bible says the soul that sin shall die, the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, means the father shall not bear the sins of the sons, neither shall the son bear the sin of the father. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked turns and repents, he shall not die. So if, sister, we do agree that human beings do make mistakes, we do commit sin, for that we have to repent. How to repent? By following the commandment of Almighty God. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that you ask for forgiveness from Almighty God, He'll forgive you. That's what the Quran says. That you have to repent, you have to toba. And if you repent in the right way, then inshallah Almighty God will forgive you. Nowhere did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, say that you believe me, that I am God, you believe that I died for your sin. This is a theory of St. Paul, which is mentioned in Corinthians, of St. Paul. And that also, if you analyze that, if you see my video cassette, was Christ crucified? We can prove even from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. So even if you agree with St. Paul's theory that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came to take over the sins, that theory itself has got no basis because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, even according to the Bible, he was not crucified. For more details, you can refer to my video cassette, a debate with Hai, which I had with an Arab pastor. Arab pastor, was Christ crucified? Hope that answers the question, sister. Yeah, can we have a question from the brother's side? If this, if the sister wants to respond, she's free to respond um, when the sister's turn comes about. Um, we aren't here to um, make sure people um, don't have an opportunity to express their views. Can the brothers ask the question? Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Naik. I have a simple but technical question. Um, Islam is about worshipping Allah. Does Allah mean the God, as in a composition of the two words al ilah The brother asked the question that does Allah mean the God as composition of al ilah The moment I told you in my talk, if it's the God, then they can be the God, the Goddess also it can be. It can be the Godfather also. It can be the Godmother also. Therefore, Allah is not the God. Allah is Allah. Who is Allah? If you want to define Allah the best way, He is one and only, absolute eternal, begets not noisy begotten, and there is nothing like Him. This is Allah. God is not the correct word, but because when you speak with non-Muslim like the way I am doing, when I speak with non-Muslim and I use the word God just so that they don't misunderstand that Allah may be some deity etc. For that purpose fine. But God is not the appropriate translation for Allah and neither it is the Allah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Can we have a question from the sister's side? His name. Assalamu alaikum. You've not mentioned the Gospel of Barnabas. Is there a reason for that? Um, is that Gospel not accepted as an authentic Gospel? Thanks. The sister asked me the question that I have not mentioned about the Gospel of Barnabas. Why? Is it that it's not authentic? Sister, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111. It says that all those who say, they boast that you shall never enter Jannah unless you be a Jew or a Christian. 
وقال لیت کھل جنت اللہ من کانا ہودن و نصارہ دے سے دا دوزن کرشن that you Muslims you shall never enter جنہ unless you be a Jew or a Christian اللہ سے تلک امانی جہم this is the wishful thinking بقواس ہے بقواس when desires کل tell them ہا تو بھرا نکم produce your proof ان کن تم صادقین but if you're truthful Allah says when anyone makes tall claim that you shall not enter Jannah, tell them قُلْ حَاتُ بُنْحَانَكُمْ Produce your proof in Qudum Sadiqin but if you're truthful. Now the Christians, they have produced their proof as the Bible. You have to ask them for their proof. You cannot say this is your proof. Let them produce the proof. And the Christian as a whole, they do not consider Gospel of Barnabas to be authentic. Though I do agree Gospel of Barnabas is more closer to the Islamic viewpoint as compared to the other Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But since they don't consider it authentic, and when we can prove our point that there is only one God from these four Gospels, when we can prove our point that Jesus is not God, peace be upon him, from these four Gospels, when we can prove our point that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified from the present Bible, so why should we go after Gospel of Barnabas? If you want to read Gospel of Barnabas for academic purposes, Alhamdulillah. But I never use it as an argument to the Christians, because first I'll have to have a debate with them that Gospel of Barnabas is true. At the end of five years, they may not agree. At the end of five hours, the Christian may not agree. So why should I waste my time? When I can prove my point, the Islamic viewpoint from the present Bible which they are holding, which they say is the word of God, the present for gospel which they believe in, so why should I go for gospel of Barnabas? Reading for academic purposes, it is good. But while doing dawah, I feel you should keep the gospel of Barnabas out because the Christians don't consider that to be authentic or to be the word of God. Hope that answers the question. We've only got time for about two more questions, so um, if the questioners feel their questions are important to the topic. Okay, okay go on. Okay, my question is regarding the mission of the prophets. To me it seems that the prophets came with a mission with, which had a political nature. They came for a state, a power. As Allah said to Moses, Izhab ila fara'una innahu tagha, go to Pharaoh. Allah did not say go to Bani Israel. Because Pharaoh was in charge of a state, uh, a government. So isn't Islam the mission of the prophets uh, have a political nature? And from the very onset of Islam, when the prophet <coughs> went on the mount, he said, I'll give you this kalima with which the Arab and the Ajum world will be at your feet. So he was indicating towards a mission, towards a political nature, uh, this mission of the prophets had, which uh, seemed that was not covered by your talk. Well, that was the question that he feels that the three prophets that came, they had more of a political nature, which I didn't cover in my talk. And he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, go to the Pharaoh. He didn't say go to Bani Israel. Brother, quoting half the verse. The complete verse says, go to Pharaoh for what? To believe in one God. That to believe the Bani, that to free the Bani Israel. Did Moses say make me king? Did he say make me king of Egypt? He went to the king to free the Jews, to free the Bani Israel. He didn't go to Pharaoh to say, okay, let's have a fight and now I want to be the political leader. He never said that. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Which political leader he wanted to become? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was offered by the pagan Arabs, by the Kuffars. If you know, it's mentioned in the hadith that Udba, one of the representatives of the pagan Arabs, they said that, oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if you give up a mission, we will make you the wealthiest man in the full country. We will make you the leader of a community. We will crown you king. And the Prophet didn't agree. They went even through his uncle that give up, don't divide the people, don't say there's only one God. If you give up this mission, we will make you king. And the Prophet said, told his uncle, Abu Talib, that even if they place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I will not give up the mission until I die. So where is the political nature? Yes, politics is there in Islam. But these people were sent to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the message is spread, how to lead a life and how to set up a country and a state is also mentioned. But the main thing was calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you become a majority, and when you have a particular state, how to lay down the rules and regulations of Allah says. But Moses, peace be upon him, was not sent to the Pharaoh to become the king of Egypt. He was sent to free the people who were in bondage, so that later on when they become free, they can follow a life as laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam does include politics, but that doesn't mean it came to conquer the politics and become the king, etc. Hope that answers the question. Can you have a question from the sister's side? 
Assalamu alaikum. Um, the question is, what was the purpose of the prophets before Muhammad, peace be upon him, if they did not give the full teachings of Islam? And also, why did Islam come to Prophet Muhammad uh, instead of and not Prophet Moses or Prophet Jesus? This is just the question that what was the purpose of all the prophets that came before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam if they didn't preach Islam? And why did Islam come to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and why not to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him? Sister, the reply is, as I mentioned in my talk, all the prophets preached nothing but Islam. Even Adam preached Islam, peace be upon him. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishaq, Ismail, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All of them preached nothing but Islam. Islam by definition means submitting our will to Almighty God. What your question can be rephrased, sister, that why wasn't the last and final revelation in the Quran given to Moses, peace? That can be asked. All the prophets preached Islam, but Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last and final messenger. Because he was the last and final messenger, to him was revealed the last and final revelation. The question can be rephrased and can be asked that why didn't the last and final revelation came to Prophet Moses peace be upon him? Why didn't the first messenger Adam peace be upon him only got the Quran and the matter is over? Sister, as I mentioned, all the prophets taught nothing but Islam. Islam means submitting a will to Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa taala. The reason is, for example. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to become a doctor. I am asking my mother, I am asking my father, Father, why did you put me in a medical college directly? Why did you put me in nursery and first standard, second standard, third standard, and then schooling and then college? Why didn't you put me in a medical college directly? There is a requirement that if you want to pass a medical college, first you have to do your kindergarten, and then you have to do your schooling, and then come to the college, and then get the grades. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself knows. That when is the best time a human being can receive the message? I feel Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He is most wise. He knew that if this message came earlier, the human being may not be in a capacity to assimilate it, to digest it. I feel Allah in His divine wisdom, He is the author of the Quran. He is the creator of us. He knows best when human being can receive it. And Allah thought it fit 1400 years back. This is the time when human beings can receive it, and that is the time He gave the last and final message. That is the glorious Quran. Hope that's the question. Alhamdulillah, we've got some barakah in our time. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I wanted to ask a first question, which the sister already asked about the Gospel of Barnabas. I wanted to ask why it's not mentioned in the Bible, but I'll leave that to your side. My second question is regarding crucifixion, which you mentioned uh, very briefly in your could talk. Could the brother please uh, raise his voice, inshallah? Or, okay. or could the brothers yeah. with the volume raise their mic? Yes. It mentions in the Quran, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ Which means that they did not kill them, nor did they crucify him. But it was, it was uh, made unto them. I want to ask, what does the Quran mean by but what it was made unto them? Jazakallah khair. <coughs> what the brother has quoted the verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 157, which says that they said in boast, we killed Jesus, the son of Mary. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ is full of doubts. With only conjecture to follow. For a surety they killed him not. So we are asking the question that if Jesus Christ peace was not killed, wasn't killed, what happened to him? What happened to him? And the Quran says, he, because the Christians, most of them they believe that Jesus Christ peace be upon him was crucified. So your Allah clarifies that he was not killed, he was not crucified. It was made to appear so. Made to appear so means it was made to appear so. How it happened? When Allah does not want to give us the details, why should we actually strive to know the details? And Allah says that it was made to appear so. And all those who differ, there are many hypotheses that come that there was a man who was put instead of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, maybe it was Judas or maybe it was a Roman soldier, there are many hypotheses. But when Allah says, he was not killed, he was not crucified, was made to appear so, all those who differ are full of doubts. Illa tiba zan, with only conjecture to follow. So when, what difference does it make, even if you come to know what happened, what difference does it make in a faith? So when Allah does not want to reveal, Allah says he was not killed, he was not crucified, that's sufficient for us. If you want to prove to a Christian how he was not crucified, why he was not crucified, and how to prove from the Bible, you can refer to my video cassette, was Christ uh, really crucified? It's a debate. 
But regarding what happened, for us Muslim it's sufficient, Allah says he was not called, he was not crucified, it's sufficient. What happened to him after that is mentioned. As Allah says in the Quran in the next verse, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up alive. So we know that he was raised him up alive. That Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was raised up alive. And we believe he is going to come again in the second coming, which is also mentioned in the Gospel of John. That he's going to come. He's going to come why? The reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept him alive is because he is the only prophet of God whose followers as a whole mistook that he claimed divinity. There is no other prophet of God whose followers considered that that prophet claimed divinity. He's the only one. That is the reason he has been raised up alive so that in the second coming he can clarify. As is mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. He will tell in the second coming, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you bear witness. I never told them to worship me, but I said, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Similarly, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John. On that day, when people will come and say, Oh Lord, Oh Master, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will tell them, E men of iniquity, E sinful people, you get out from here, I don't even know you. When Christians will come in the second coming, Oh Lord, Oh Master, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? Bible says, Gospel of John, He will say, E sinful people, you get out from here, I don't even know you. He will come in the second coming, not to teach us anything new, our religion, Islam, is complete. As Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3, this thing is complete. Nothing new can be added, nothing can be subtracted. He will come to testify to the Christians that he never claimed divinity. Hope that answers the question. Can we the next question, please, from the sister's side? And the question is, why do some Christians believe Jesus is God and others believe that he was the Son of God? Thank you. Sister has a question that why do some Christians believe he is God and some Christians believe that he is son of God? It is one and the same according to them. Because the son of God, like a son of man will be man, a son of goat will be goat, a son of lion will be lion, similarly son of God will be God. That is the concept. So if they say son of God or they say God, son of God meaning begotten son of God. Not the son of God as mentioned in the Bible like a righteous person. In that way, if you are righteous, you become a children of God. If I am righteous, I become son of God, no problem. But what they mean, begotten son of God. Begotten son of God, if the son of begotten son of God, God's son will also be God. And that's context. That's the reason, if they say son of God, it's the same for them, or if they say God, it's the same for them. Hope that answers the question. But I proved in my lecture, he never claimed divinity, he never said that he was God. If any Christian can show me any unequivocal statement in the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity immediately today. Does anyone want to take up that challenge? <laughs> okay, inshallah, brother. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I came from America, and your brothers and sisters in America, especially in Oklahoma, convey their salam and students of Peace Academy also in Oklahoma convey their salam. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you, uh, increase you in knowledge, and grant you ikhlas or sincerity. My request or question is if you could shed some light on the notion of Trinity and how it can be refuted logically as well as biblically. Azakallahu khair. You were supposed to question that can I throw some more light on Trinity? How can logically prove it is wrong and biblically prove it is wrong? Brother, the word Trinity does not exist anywhere in the Bible. If you read the full Bible, the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible. But it is found in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171, Don't say Trinity. This is stop, it is better for you. For your God and our God is one Lord. Allah repeats the message in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73. لَقَدْ كَفْرُ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ سَالِسُ سَلَاسَ They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming. Those who say that God is three in one, those who say Trinity. So the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible, but it is in the Quran. Quran says, do not say Trinity. Now the Christian missionaries, when they believe in this concept of Trinity, the closest verse they can quote of the Bible, which comes closest not exactly, but closest to the concept of infinity is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For God so loved the world, that, the uh, first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 3, which says, that for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The closest verse 
in the Bible which can come close to the Trinity is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And if you read the Revised Standard Version, revised by Thaidu scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different copy denominations, they say that this verse, first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, is a concoction. It's a fabrication. It's an interpolation. And they've thrown this word out of the Bible. The only verse in the Bible which can come closest to the Trinity, the Christian scholars had thrown out of the Bible. So the whole concept of Trinity is not there at all. Because when Jesus Christ, peace be upon us, asked that which is the first of the commandment, he replied in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, he said, Shama Israelo, Adnarhainu Adnaikhad, Yero Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. He never said Trinity. He said there is only one God. This is a catechism of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church, which says that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person, but they aren't three persons, they are one person. This is the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person. They aren't three persons, they are one person. I asked them, what person, 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 but not three person, one person? They didn't sound like English. Suppose there are three triplets, and if one of them commits murder, can you hang the other? They say no. I ask them why. They say because each one has a different personality. I said yes. And when we ask the Christians, the Christians when they talk about Father in Heaven, they have a mental concept, something like Santa Claus, sitting in the heavens, with the earth as a footstool. When they think about the Son, or the Word, they are thinking of Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, somewhat like Jeffrey Hunter in the movie King of Kings, you know, blonde eyes, good nose, no, blonde hair, blue eyes, Jeffrey Hunter, King of Kings. And when they are thinking about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, it's somewhat like the fire that came in Pentecost or the dove when Jesus Christ peace be when he was being baptized. There are three different mental pictures. But when we ask them that when you talk about Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, how many pictures do you have in mind? They will tell you one. Believe me, they are lying to you. The three different mental pictures, how much you try to superimpose, you can never superimpose. Because one plus one plus one is equal to three, it's not equal to one. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Depending on the time taken, this would probably be the last question. So, um, inshallah, could the sister proceed? Assalamu alaikum. The Christians believe in one God, the Jews believe in one God, the Muslims believe in one God. Somebody said to me that, there's a few ways to get to the mountain. Why should he follow the Islamic path to submit to that only one God? Thank you. Sister has the question that the Jews believe in one God, the Christians believe in one God, the Muslims believe in one God. All lead to God. So why follow only Islam? That was, sister, the basis of the talk was that Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them, three men, one mission. All what we talk about Judaism, Christianity, what Moses, peace be upon him, taught was nothing but Islam. What Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, taught was nothing but Islam. What Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught was nothing but Islam. So, if you say, I'm going to follow Judaism. If you follow Judaism, you have to believe in what Moses, peace be upon him, said. Moses said that there's a prophet to come, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and you have to follow him. If you want to follow Christianity, you have to follow Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He said in Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you into all truth. So if you have to be a good Jew, you actually finally have to be a good Muslim. If you have to be a good Christian, you finally have to be a good Muslim. All these, if you have to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have to be a good Muslim. All these prophets of God that came, right from starting, up to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Adam, peace be upon him, Muhammad, all of them taught the same message. And the other superficial thing may have changed here and there a little bit. But the basic message of Tawheed, oneness of God, was said. And if you follow them, you'll come to know they said that about the finer details, more will be told to you later on. All the prophets said that. And all of them indicated that a final message, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu will be coming, a final messenger, and he'll be getting the final message that the glorious Quran. That's the reason. The only way, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion, the only way of life acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. That is submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that 
If anyone desires any other religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the Akhirah, he will be among the losers. So the religion taught by all the prophets of God was nothing but Islam. That's the reason, the only religion that the true religion is religion of Islam, that is submitting a will to Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Okay, we can take one more question. Um, are the brothers, if they want to decide amongst themselves as to whose question is more important or... Um, we've got a question here which uh, said, Since all three men came with the same mission from the same one God, does it matter which one messenger is followed? I think that might have been answered in, in the last answer you gave. So, inshallah, could uh, Don't take up the time deciding. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Um, you mentioned a hadith earlier on about um, which is mentioned in Sahih Abu Dawud and you said that I can't remember the name of the Sahabi but you said that I, he said I saw my father praying without his shoes and with his shoes on. In the commentary of this hadith it mentions that Rasulullah and the Sahaba the only time they prayed with their shoes on was at the time of jihad no other time. Can you expand on this? Did you mean that we can pray with our shoes on at any time? Or did you mean that we pray with our shoes on at the time of jihad? I suppose the question that I said in my talk and he quoted the hadith, the reference I'll give you is Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number one, chapter number 240 in the book of Salah, hadith number 653. It was Shoaib ibn Umar who said, his father said that his father he heard his father saying that the Prophet prayed. What you said that the Sahaba said his father prayed. If the sah it's not his father prayed. His father said that his father saw the Prophet praying with his shoes on as well as barefooted. Regarding you saying that he, the Prophet only prayed during jihad. That's totally wrong. There are several hadith. That's not the only hadith. If you go to a hadith before that in Sunnah Abu Dawud, Volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 240, hadith number 652, the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the Jews do. They pray, removing their footwear. That means a commandment. So therefore, the scholar says, at least once in your lifetime, you should pray with your shoes on. But today, because the mosque is in a different situation as compared to that time, previously the mosque were made of, the ground was dirty and mud, that's why. Therefore now when we go to the mosque, we take out our footwear. But yet if you go to the haram, yet you'll find some people who wear clean shoes, their soles are clean, yet they go inside with shoes on. So even you can pray with shoes on any time, but see to it, as the Prophet said, that clean your souls. You can even pray here, you don't have to pray only in jihad. That's a misconception. You can pray with your shoes on, but it, the soul should be clean. But as a general rule, because you go in a mosque, and the mosque nowadays as compared to the time of the Prophet, now it's different, it has marble, it has clean flooring. That is the reason we most of the time when we go in the mosque, we take off our shoes. But if someone goes into the mosque, even with the shoes on, I'm sure most of the Muslims will catch him and even hammer him. <laughs> but the Prophet also went, you can go with your shoes on. But see to it is clean, but as a general rule, I advise you not to go, not that you can go, but because now it is a different thing, it's clean, etc. And how much you clean your soul, it may not be clean, but if you want, you can go. The Prophet has given permission, it is not only during jihad. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhir dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair. وَالْأَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ